I am going to start now the tensorial representation of stress and strain and in this case we have to learn a few basic things. I know certain things are not taught to the Indian students, the geology and the geophysics students who have done their bachelors or even their masters courses. So I will talk about the basic prerequisite for the tensorial study. Our aim is not to get into the tensorial calculus, neither to get into third rank, fourth rank tensors. Here the aim is to understand stress and strain in terms of tensors. So we start with the basic things. Consider that there are a set of n variables x1, x2 up to xn. I am not calling this as x square, neither calling this as x to the power n. So these xi are called the coordinates and they lie in the n dimensional space which can be represented by symbolized as vn. Now we can define a subspace Vm where m is less than n. What can be the good example of this x1, x2, x3, etc. Imagine there is a coordinate 2,5 in the xy coordinate system in two dimension. So this 2,5 will be plotted over here. This point P falls within the xy plane and it is within the two dimensional space here n equal to 2 and vn is basically v2 this is the conventional two dimensional space where we have done coordinate geometry in our school days. Similarly if I write down the coordinate of a point as 2 5 and minus 9 then that means n is equal to 3 or we are dealing with the three dimensional space where the three dimensional coordinate geometry is known I hope to the viewers. So subspace Vm what it would mean? Suppose this point 2, 5, comma, minus 9 and in the three dimensional space this represents a point P dash. Now if out of these three I take only these two 2 and 5 and write P as 2, comma, 5 then what happens? In the three dimensional space 2, comma, 5, comma, minus 9 that point is projected in the two dimensional space. So in that case this projection is a subspace of this three dimensional space. Now here this 2, 5 coordinate can be also further resolved into along the x and y coordinate. For example, this distance is 2 unit and that distance is the 5 unit. So if I plot this point, project this point on this x axis, then this projection can be called as let us say P2 and P2 has a unit of 2 like 2 unit distance from some specific reference point. So in this case this becomes a one dimensional space, here it is V1 that means M equal to 1. So this along line what the projection has been made is a subspace of the two dimensional geometry. In this way we understand these things. So to repeat this 1, 2 and n are not the power index. It does not mean x square, x cube or x to the power n. Now the question comes why we are writing like this? Because if I am writing instead of 1, 2 at the bottom, 1, 2 at the top, this gives us an opportunity to also put some numbers at the bottom as subscript and this becomes important in further studies. One point I want to mention not everything in the basics that I am covering will be applied in my own lecture but those who want to get into the detail of tensorial representation of stress and strain then these basics will be everything will be required. Okay, now we will look at a representation a i j where i is called as a superscript, j is called as a subscript and this i and j together can be called as a suffix. We will see its use in due course. x i and square this means square of x i say x i equal to 7 then x i square will mean 49. 
So we are getting convergent with the way of writing. Now we will look into the Einstein summation convention. What is that? We can write an expression a1 x1 plus a2 x2 up to a n x n. So here again this 1, 2 are not the powers. For example, this is not x square. a1 is one kind of a number, a2 is that kind of a number and x1, x2, etc up to xn are other kinds of numbers. So this can be represented in this way summation symbol i equal to 1 to n a i x i. Now the Einstein summation convention says that drop this writing altogether and just write a i x i. a i x i henceforth will automatically mean this sum. We will see such problem soon. Now, if a suffix occurs twice in a term, by the way, what is a suffix? Let us get back here. When I am writing as a i j, then this is i is superscript, j is subscript, i and j together is called a suffix. Now, if a suffix occurs twice in a term, for example, a mu i x i, so what is occurring twice? i is occurring twice. Then what happens? Then this i is called the dummy suffix, also called the dextral index or the umbral suffix. And one interesting observation can be made if I write a mu j x j. So here j is repeated, so j is the dummy suffix. I can expand it, you can watch. For example, I am writing j equal to 1 and keeping mu as constant. So a, a mu 1 x 1 plus a mu 2 x 2, it goes up to n, a mu n x n. Now, this j, the dummy suffix can be replaced by another symbol, say i. For example, now if you expand it, the same expansion will come a mu 1 x 1, a mu 2 x 2, etc. So, that is the reason why we call them as the, this as the dummy suffix or this as the dummy suffix because this suffix can be replaced by any other symbol or letter. And a suffix that does not repeat is called as the real suffix. Where is the example? If I write a mu j x j, mu is not repeated. So mu can be called as a real suffix. And what we did for a dummy suffix, instead of j I could write i, but that cannot be done here. For example, a mu j x j cannot be replaced by or let us say a mu i x i cannot be replaced by a v i x i. This mu and v the moment we put they mean altogether different things and this is the way things are defined. We will see more. In the tensorial studies we frequently use the term Kronecker delta and try to understand it. Delta i j this value will be equal to 1 if i is equal to j and we will take if i not equal to j the value will be 0. So, instead of delta ij in this way, we also write it as delta ij. One way to remember the delta ij value is to remember the identity matrix i2 here 1001 and delta ij in this format. So, this value is delta 11, this is delta 12, this is delta 21 and this is delta 22. So, as you see when i is equal to j, uh, the value becomes 1 and in all other cases the value is equal to 0. Now, if I go forward, if I say write delta 3, 4, this will be 0 because i not equal to j and if I write delta 3, 3, it will be equal to 1. Now, if I write delta i, i, where i is a single number, specific number, then it will mean 1 as per what we have said. But if we follow the Einstein summation and you write delta i, i, then it will be delta 1 1 plus delta 2 2 up to delta n n. So, each of these values will be equal to 1 and it comes n number of times. So, n multiplied by 1 and the answer becomes n. So, in this case we can write delta i i is equal to delta m m when both are the Einstein summation notation. And here you see i is repeated, m is repeated. So, they are dummy suffix and therefore, instead of i any other letter can be used. Now let us see how the Kronecker delta works. Prove that delta i j a j k is equal to a i k. Now here is the proof. 
for i is equal to 1, I can write this as delta 1j a j k. Now, since it is an Einstein summation, I can expand for j equal to 1, j equal to 2 up to j equal to n that has been done. Now, what we observe is that only for this Kronecker delta that delta 1 1 is basically since the suffixes are the same, it will be 1. So, it comes out to be a 1 k and here since the suffixes are not matching, so therefore, they will be all 0. So, these terms are vanished. So, similarly, we can say taking i equal to 2 delta 2 j a j k will be equal to a 2 k. So, in this way for i equal to 1, i equal to 2, i equal to 3, same thing will go on. So, now we can generalize instead of taking 1, 2, etcetera by putting here i delta i j a j k will be equal to a i k. So, what it has involved? This problem has involved the Einstein summation and also the Kronecker delta. So, for the time being, we can have two more examples how the Kronecker delta is used. There are many other, but just these two might be easier to understand. Delta i j multiplied by delta j k prove that is equal to delta i k. So, this looks like as if we are asking that as if this j cancels out i goes there and k goes there. And if this is so, which we will prove, this is the great advantage of writing i in the subscript j is the i in the superscript j as subscript j in the superscript and k is the subscript. So, that was the purpose of doing it as if you can see j gets cancelled and delta i and k goes. So, here is the proof. Put for j equal to 1, what will be the expression delta i 1 and j equal to 1. So, this is del delta 1 k plus. Now, this is an Einstein summation. The next term will be for j equal to 2 delta 2 and the top is i. We are not doing anything there. Delta k, delta k goes there, but this j becomes 2. Similarly, this term goes up to delta i and n and delta n and k. But in this process of journey, one interesting term is there. What happens when j is equal to i? So, in that case, this becomes delta i, i at the subscript and then delta k and then i over here. Now, we look at individual Kronecker delta and try to understand since i and 1 are not equal, so it will be 0. Similarly, this term is also 0, this term is also 0. There is only one term which is non-zero that is delta i i. Delta i i we said when the subscript and superscript are the same is equal to 1. So, therefore, if it is 1, the entire thing simplifies to delta i k, delta i k. Now, if this is understood, we will look at this one, delta i j multiplied by delta j i and then there is an Einstein summation involved. How it simplifies? We have seen already that this j can be cancelled out and then it becomes delta i i just now it is proved and we have shown it today in the beginning of the class that when this is delta i i then it becomes n because delta i i means basically delta 1 1 plus delta 2 2 it goes up to delta n n. So, what comes out is 1 plus 1 plus 1, 1 comes n number of times. So, this becomes equal to n. So, when delta i j multiplied by delta j i simplifies to delta i i and that is in the Einstein summation symbol it goes to n. We have seen the new symbols and let us see how a set of equations can be smartly be presented in terms of that symbol. Consider n number of equations and I read here a 1 1 x 1 plus a 1 2 x 2 it goes up to a 1 n x n equal to b 1. So, needless to mention that these 1, 2, n and 1 are not the powers. Now, the second equation is a 2, 1, x 1, a 2, 2, x 2 like that and then b 2. In this way, n number of equations are written a 1, 1, a 2, 1. So, then the nth equation is a n 1. So, I am writing here there are n number of equations. Now, there are n number of unknowns these are the unknowns. As you see, if I start counting from here 1, 2 and it goes up to n. So, we have n number of equations and also 
n number of unknowns and these are the unknowns and certain values are known these are the known values i will demonstrate with an example soon these are the known values in other words a i j is known value so if i give our common example which we all understand an equation say 5x plus 7y equal to 17 and 2x minus 0.2y equal to 4. Here x and y can be solved. We have two equations 1 and 2 and two unknowns x and y. So these can be now compared with these equations. For example, here 5 can be a11 x like x1 then 7 is like a12 and y is x2 here 2 will be a21 x will be x1 minus 0.2 is a22 and y is x2 and here 17 is b1 4 is b2 so in this way i hope it is understood two equations two unknowns and how these symbols can be correlated with what we have seen in the school now interestingly these equations can be simply be comp compiled in this way a i j x j equal to b i here we mean the einstein summation by the way and i referred whenever i am writing like this it will most of the time indicate einstein summation for example, how can this representation indicate so many equations? I am trying to explain. Let us take i equal to 1. So, a i j x j is equal to b 1. Now, what to do? This j will be expanded from 1 to n. So, here is j is equal to 1, j is equal to 2. It goes up to j equal to n. Once that is being done, you can compare this equation 1 with this equation 2 they are basically the same equation. Similarly, if I take i equal to 2, I can write such a form and then I can expand. Once I expand, I will get this equation. Similarly, for i equal to n, I can write such a form and then expand, I will get that equation. So, we have to remember that this is the smartest and the shortest presentation of the n number of equations with n number of unknowns. Let us understand the meaning of scalar field and the vector field. A real valued function that associates a scalar that is real number is called a scalar field. To give an example, imagine there is a material and at each point within the material there are different densities. So I can say that the density is a function of x, y, z coordinate axis. And uh, then this x, y, z are the scalar numbers and the real numbers and then that defines a scalar field which is the density variation within the material. On the other hand, what about the vector field? It is specified by magnitude and direction. For example, there is a material and at x, y, z coordinate it has a density but that also keeps changing with time. So, there is a fourth dimension involved time dimension. So, in this case such a situation can come when there is a flowing fluid through a closed region. So, the rho x y z t together will be called as a vector field. I have already given an example in one of my previous lectures how to deal with the material with the density at varying at different points and how to find out the representative density. Now we are going to see the dot product of the two vectors and some important things we will be discussing. I hope you already know. Just revising and then we will get into a few new things. Imagine that there are two vectors u and v and theta is the angle between them and small u, I am sorry, the unbold u and the unbold v are the magnitudes and this is bold u and this is bold v. The dot product is given by u dot v is equal to u and v unbold so their magnitudes being multiplied and cos theta theta is the angle between them so this is known now from here we go one step ahead we say that a vector set u1 u2 etc up to un is called orthogonal set or orthogonal system 
if u i multiplied by u j or u i dot product u j is equal to 0 when i is not equal to j. So, for example, we can say that there are three orthogonal vectors. If we think about in space, there are three orthogonal vectors, they need not be these vectors need not be parallel to the coordinate axis x, y, z. They can be oriented like this, whereas the coordinate axis is like that. I repeat, the coordinate axis can be oriented like this, whereas the three vectors can be oriented like that. So, they are mutually perpendicular to each other. So, if I take their magnitudes and find out the cos 90 degree which is 0 and do this dot product, I will get 0 when i is not equal to j. So, one more example can be given in terms of the principal stress axis sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3. In case of the principal stress axis, they are perpendicular to each other and they can be of any orientation. In case two of them are horizontal and one is vertical or I can represent like that, it is an Andersonian stress regime. Be it Andersonian or a non-Andersonian stress regime, we will also find that the dot product of this principal stress will be equal to 0. So, they also define the orthogonal set or the orthogonal system. So, we have defined in terms of three vectors. It can also be defined in terms of two perpendicular vectors. They may be horizontal, one may be vertical, one may be horizontal or none of them is vertical, none of them is horizontal. If, 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 if the angle between them is 90 degree, then also they will define an orthogonal set or an orthogonal system. What about a single vector? If it is a single vector, the definition does not work because as you see, I need two vectors. So, that is what I am writing here that a single vector cannot form an orthogonal set. Now, additionally, if we say that the each of these vectors within the orthogonal set are of unit length, in that case, we call those vectors as orthonormal vectors. So, orthonormal vectors can be a type of orthogonal might be within the orthogonal set and not all vectors within the orthogonal set will satisfy the orthonormal vector definition. So, in case of the principal stress axis I was talking, let us say all of them are of equal magnitude that means a hydrostatic stress regime. In that situation we are dealing with an orthonormal vectors or here we are basically meaning that stress in terms of vectors. And we will also see stress in terms of tensors, which is the main discussion right now going on. Stress as vector, we have already done lectures where the addition of the vectors have been done, addition of stress in 3D and 2D has been done in the Cartesian coordinate system with the plunge and trend, etc. Here we are mainly moving towards stress in terms of tensor. We will also see slowly that strain and other parameters related to the stress and strain, such as Young's modulus can also be represented as a tensor. Now, let us see more about the orthonormal vector and how the Kronecker delta can also be brought into consideration. U i dot u j where u i and u j are the orthonormal vectors can be represented also as the delta i j. How it is so? For i equal to j, u i dot product with u i. So, u i magnitude, the u i magnitude again they are in unbold and then cos 0, the vector makes 0 angle with itself. Cos 0 is equal to 1 and they are of unit length, so it turns out to be 1. So, this is followed and for i not equal to j, u i dot product u j by definition is also 0. So, therefore, it is said that u i dot u j is equal to the Kronecker delta i j. Now, we are going to see the permutation symbol or the levi civita symbol this also is used in the tensorial works. Whatever I am doing is the elementary or the base of your future work, not everything I will be taking forward in this lecture course, but it is important to know the fundamentals and out of these fundamentals a few I will be taking forward. Okay. Epsilon i j k is a permutation symbol and it is equal to 1 if i j k is equal to 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1 or 3, 1, 2 epsilon i j k is minus 1 if i j k the sequence of number is 3 to 1, 1, 3, 2 and 2, 1, 3 and epsilon i j k is equal to 0 if any two indices are the same such as say i j k equal to 1, 1, 2, 1 is repeated or 2, 3, 3, 3 is repeated or 3, 3, 3 all three are same that means 
two of them are certainly the same or if I write in this way 1 2 1 that also will be giving rise to 0 value. How to remember this sequence of numbers? Draw a circle and put number 1, 2 and 3. Now see this number 1, 2, 3 sequence, 1, 2, 3, the next is 2, 3, 1 and the third is 3, 1, 2. So we can remember and about this one 3, 2, 1, it is counterclockwise rotation 3, 2, 1, 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2 counterclockwise and 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 3. So in case of how to remember these sequences numbers, draw a circle, write 1, 2, 3 and clockwise whatever comes the three numbers in sequence that will give you the magnitude 1. We will see its use soon and if counterclockwise they are coming in a sequence then the number is minus 1 and if any number is repeated the number will be uh, here it will be 0. Now let us understand it how it works. D is a determinant I have represented A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. There are 9 elements in this determinant and it can be expanded. Now the use of the permutation symbol will be like this. This expansion you can make and if you expand this we will get the same uh, expanded form i equal to 1 to 3 and then j equal to 1 to 3 and then some k equal to 1 to 3 epsilon i j k a i b j c k. Once the expansion is done and I will do a part of the expansion here and I would request that you do the full expansion and cross check. I wrote a determinant and then by the way I erased it and I say that this is the full form in terms of the permutation index which I have shown. Now how to expand it I am just doing for the geology students a bit and then I would request the students to do it by their own completely. Let us look at it how we are doing. We are first going to open k equal to 1 to 3 by putting values over here d equal to sigma summation i equal to 1 to 3 this does not change then sum j equal to 1 to 3 this does not change but this k 1 to 3 i am opening up in this way epsilon i j 1 k was here so it is 1 a i b j c 1 next same summation and then epsilon 1 j 2 k is equal to 2 is given a i b j c 2 j equal to 2 is given and then the same summation i equal to 1 to 3 j equal to 1 to 3 a i b j c 3 k is equal to 3 i have taken and is equal to epsilon i j k equal to 3. Once this is being done your next job now the students have to do you have to break this summation into 3 more terms will come out from here. Similarly from here open this up for j equal to 1, 2, 3 and here also you do for j equal to 1, 2, 3. Once that is being opened up then you open up each of those 3 terms by i equal to 1, 2, 3. So altogether 3 into 3 I think 9 terms are coming up. So from here will be 3 into 3, 9 terms. Here will be 3 into 3, 9 terms and here will be 3 into 3. 9 terms. So 9 comes 3 times. Now if this is true we can go to the d1 determinant here a1, a2, b1, b2. So now the formula can also be little bit changed i equal to 1 to 2, j equal to 1 to 2 there is no k term epsilon ij, ai, bj. ai, bj so I will take 2 numbers in the circle 1 and 2 epsilon ij it will be 1 under what situation. You can write down thinking about what I told there it is equal to minus 1 under what situation and it is equal to 0 when it is epsilon 1 1 or epsilon 2 2. So expand this term and for expansion first to expand this part then expand that part and apply these and you will get finally a1 b2 minus a2 b1 which is this a1 b2 minus a2 b1. So we have seen how the determinants can be represented in terms of this index. What has been shown for a small determinant and little bit bigger determinant we can go for a determinant where there are n number of rows and n number of columns. Let us see. We looked at the determinant and how using the permutation symbol it can be expressed. Now here is a more generalized a1, a2, a3 up to a n b1, b2, b3 up to bn different elements and it goes on a1, b1 it goes up to lambda1, lambda2, lambda3 up to lambda n. 
So if we expand how it will look like, it will go like this summation i equal to 1 to n, j equal to 1 to n and such summations will go for t equal to 1 to n and the permutation symbol will look like this epsilon i j and other symbols up to t and then multiplied by a i b j it goes on up to lambda t. You can look at this determinant and this expression and the smaller determinants that I wrote and you will try to see the things are similar. We will now have a look at the cross product or the vector product or the outer product and we will see how the permutation symbol can also be used in that case. Just to recollect on the uv plane u and v are the two vectors acting at an angle theta. What is the cross product? u cross v is a vector that works perpendicular to the uv plane and the magnitude is given by u's magnitude multiplied by v's magnitude multiplied by sin theta where theta is the angle and the n I write for indicating that, the, that, is, that it is a vector. Now we write here E i cross E j is equal to k equal to 1 to 3 summation epsilon i j k e k. There are many such expressions. I am doing this one and then I will move into the tensor mode actual works. In the textbooks you will find many such expressions are there for the uh, cross product, dot product and the higher things. Anyway, E i cross E j, here E i and E j means what? E i, E j and E k are the unit vectors acting along the i, j and the k axis and their cross product has been made. So, let us try to understand it. If I expand it from k equal to 1 to 3, E i cross E j, it becomes epsilon i j 1 E 1, then epsilon i j 2 e 2 and then epsilon i j 3 e 3. Now, I take a special case where i and j basically is the same axis e 3 basically 3. So, i equal to j equal to 3 e i cross e j becomes basically e i cross e i which is e 3 cross e 3. What happens in that case? What to do? I have to put i equal to j equal to 3. Now, for i equal to j equal to 3 that means e i cross e i which is E 3 cross E 3, I have to put I equal to J equal to 3 in all these individual expressions. Once that is being done, I find that it is 1 1 1, 1 1 2 and 1 1 3. So, 1 and 1 are repeated. So, all these 3 become 0 and this is logical because if I look at the 3 perpendicular axis and which are of unit length, then I take a single axis. Let us say this is the E 3 axis and sub unit length. Its unit length multiplied by its unit length multiplied by the angle between this line and the line itself sin 0 becomes 0. So, this becomes 0. So, it is understood. Now, I take two different axis i equal to 1 and j equal to 2. So, E i cross E j becomes E 1 cross E 2. In that case what happens? I have to put i equal to 1 and j equal to 2 in all these expressions. Once that is being done, I find that here 1 is repeated. So, this permutation symbol will give 0. Here 2 is repeated. So, it will give 0 and what remains here is epsilon 1, 2, 3. They are in a cyclic sequence 1, 2 and 3. So, this will become 1. 1 multiplied by E 3 is equal to the E 3. Now, this is logical because when I take the 3 perpendicular axis of unit length, the angle between these two perpendicular axis is 90 degree, I am doing their cross product. Unit length multiplied by unit length multiplied by sin 90 degree and in the perpendicular direction the unit length will come and that has been proved. 